Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to our webinar on South Africa's hydrogen economy, where our distinguished panel of speakers will discuss the roadmap to developing a green hydrogen value chain in South Africa. Our webinar today is sponsored by Parker Hannafin and Mitochondria Energy Systems. We thank them for their support in making this event possible. Before we start, please note that we've activated the Q&A function for your questions. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. While we may not get to every question during our hour together, rest assured we will review each one. Additionally, the chat feature is enabled for your comments and insights. Look for it right next to the Q&A box. Remember though, questions should go into the Q&A to ensure that they are properly addressed in that section. Please be informed that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you afterwards. Also, we're broadcasting live on YouTube and the link will be shared in the chat once it becomes accessible. Thanks so much for your attention. Let's begin. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Dr. Tsakani Mtombeni, Executive of Sustainable Development at IMPLATS, where he is responsible for developing and implementing the group's sustainable development strategy. Sakani will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Dr. Cosmos Chiteme, Director of Power at the Department of Science and Innovation, Mashudu Ramano, the CEO and founder of Mitochondria Energy Systems, Zef Nschleko, Chief Economist at the Development Bank of Southern Africa, and Willem Fuert, Sales and Marketing Manager of Robert Bosch South Africa. And without further ado, I'll hand over now to our facilitator to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Tsakani. Well, good afternoon um, uh, to our audience. And thank you, Shannon and the team, for setting this very exciting conversation for us to um, discuss the development of the green hydrogen economy roadmap in South Africa. Um, the background to this is definitely not a local one, it's a global uh, conversation. Um, coming from the Paris Agreement um, uh, modeling at the time, it was estimated that the hydrogen energy will probably have to make up a good 5% uh, of the global energy demand. That number has now just been revised to about 15% uh, to the latest uh, reports. So this conversation comes at the right time uh, with our panelists for today. Um, we are going to be exploring policy issues. We're going to be exploring funding uh, and research and development opportunities, as well as technology commercialization, and much more important for South Africa, the local skills development. Um, we need to get through our panelists to understand where we are on the hydrogen uh, uh, hype, as they call it. Are we now at the stage where expectations can be met? Are we at the stage where we can now see more projects reaching FIDs to show that we are steadily moving into uh, the stable territory of the hydrogen economy? Um, however, the latest IEA report, the 2023 report, indicates that only 5% of these projects are actually reaching FID. So let's uh, use that uh, global and some local nuances to have a conversation with our esteemed uh, panelists for today. Uh, before I, uh, uh, I give my panelists opportunities to contribute, there's uh, five to six things that we want uh, for our audience uh, to get out of this from today. One is, uh, a good understanding for what it is that uh, South Africa is doing and what it is that we can do to contribute into the hydrogen economy and also specifically what is the South African government uh, doing uh, to catalyze this industry, what then becomes the role of the DFIs uh, in shaping and, uh, and, and, and policies that will uh, enable a viable hydrogen economy as well as uh, what then becomes of the local technology development and production capabilities in the country for us to take advantage of this. We have to look into the aspirational break-in unit costs and what that traje trajectory looks like as of today. How far off are we to a dollar per kilogram of hydrogen, particularly in South Africa? And lastly, we should be exploring collaboration opportunities uh, among private companies as well as the uh, private and public sector. 
on that note, I would like to start with us getting a very good perspective of uh, the local context uh, in terms of what it is that the, the South African government is uh, is doing on this front. Uh, if I can please have a um, an input uh, from uh, um, Dr. Cosmos from the DSI, and um, soon I would like for Zef to follow that up with the DFI perspective with the local development mandate. Dr. Chitema. Um, thank you, Dr. Mtombeni, and um, good day to all our um, uh, listeners. Um, it is indeed um, a great opportunity for me to be able to contribute uh, and give some perspectives um, on the local hydrogen economy uh, but obviously in relation to the global context. So uh, we are now at a point where um, I think the hydrogen economy has gone through a number of hype cycles, um, but uh, we are at a point where um, I think there is evidence of um, uh, um, government support, not only in South Africa, but uh, the world over. So there's indeed um, a lot of collaboration around um, trying to get uh, projects to execution stage, um, as you said. Uh, so a number of um, countries have developed um, their hydrogen strategies. And uh, here in South Africa, we had the Hydrogen Society Roadmap being approved by cabinet in 2021 and uh, released uh, through the Department of Science and Innovation in February 2022. That was then followed by the Green Hydrogen Commercialization Strategy that was led by the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. So from a policy perspective, I think we are at a point where there is clear direction um, and clear support from government. I think what we need now to do is to try and create an enabling um, environment for projects to now be executed and uh, there's a number of um, initiatives that are now being done towards that so i'll stop here for now but probably look forward to giving more details uh, as we as the conversation proceeds thanks thanks very much um, zev will you just give us a perspective from a a uh, DBSA view in the role of the DFIs up to now and how much more uh, you could be playing in this space? Thank you so much, uh, Zakani, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having us on the panel. Yes, there is a number of roles that uh, development finance institutions actually play uh, in developing the hydrogen economy. The obvious one is the financing of uh, hydrogen uh, projects. There is more than 530 uh, DFIs globally with an asset base of around uh, $23 trillion. Uh, Here in South Africa, we've got about 45 development finance institutions and development finance agencies with an asset base of around $346 billion. So there is... Uh, an asset base to leverage to to finance and develop this uh, this sector but quite frankly the development of projects only come in later in the process uh, and uh, the i feel the conversation on hydrogen uh, economy is exactly or more or less where the renewable energy conversation was uh, in the early 2000s so there's still a few critical uh, roles that DFIs should play at this uh, early execution stage. And three of them are the following, uh, Tsakane. One is the question of policy advocacy and technical assistance. I think we, as DFIs, we continue to augment the efforts of government and the capacity of the state to make sure that uh, we integrate green hydrogen uh, uh, into the national uh, energy mix. For example, we are arguing that uh, the integrated resource plan should uh, actually include assumptions, you know, about uh, uh, the production of hydrogen uh, in the future and therefore the electricity demand that come with that. It should, it should be a very clear assumption that is, that is incorporated. 
And uh, similarly, uh, we have a role to play in ensuring that uh, you know regulatory and contractual uh, frameworks and policy instruments are set up such that they support uh, the development of hydrogen. We've seen how important this is when we were setting up the independent power produ producer procurement system. So, so this is a critical, critical age area. The second role is uh, project preparation. At this early stage of uh, execution, we have to make sure that we develop uh, a project in terms of uh, how they are properly scoped and how feasibility studies are put together to make sure that these projects are bankable. And uh, as DFIs, we achieve this, of course, by using traditional uh, instruments, concessional uh, finance, grants, and even guarantees, uh, and uh, or by creating dedicated facilities and funds to deal with this. And I'll come back to this question of dedicated facilities at a later stage. But from our point of view, then, uh, project preparation contribute to this very important task of de-risking uh, projects to enable uh, even more private sector participation. The last one, uh, the last role that I think is important at this early stage is uh, developing the infrastructure, the hydrogen infrastructure. And uh, this will uh, help us ensure that uh, there's a successful hydrogen economy uh, to facilitate you know, things like storage, things like uh, transmission, uh, distribution uh, and so on. So, so this becomes an important area to to set up the infrastructure to enable, you know, the environment for for green hydrogen. Well, this uh, sounds very exciting uh, for what's coming ahead, and I do hope that uh, our audience is um, they are also preparing some very engaging um, questions for us. Uh, but let me just come back and um, um, back to mitochondria. You've been uh, talking hydrogen technology for quite a while in South Africa. You've been championing this. Um, and so if you could please just position for us how you've been uh, able to ensure that there's a sustained and a continuous conversation exactly as um, the, company, the country has come to where we are now what has been your role and some of the wins and the challenges in that regard? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tom Benny. And um, good afternoon, panel uh, colleagues on the panel. And also uh, good afternoon to the listeners. I'd like to start by saying welcome to the era of mitochondria energy. Welcome to the era of decentralized, distributed and networked energy. And welcome to the hydrogen era. As a matter of fact, uh, just to give context, the story of mitochondria and hydrogen is an old story. And in some instances, if you take hydrogen, it's a 14 billion years story. So if you go back to the beginning, uh, there was energy and there was information. And that information, that is in the Big Bang, the theory that we all have had, then that energy and information became matter. And that matter, as the scientist tells us, 300 odd years after the Big Bang, became hydrogen, and hydrogen became helium, helium, lithium, and then all the rest of the uh, elements that you find listed in the periodic um, table. So hydrogen has always been there with us. We had not actually understood that actually the whole universe is powered by hydrogen. 
we are told that 99% of the universe is hydrogen and helium. So there's never been an era where hydrogen has not played a pivotal role in the affairs of the universe and our affairs. I mean, nine, most of the power that we uh, enjoy and we use is from hydrogen of the sun. The sun is powered by hydrogen. So I just wanted us to understand that we have always lived in an hydrogen age. And we are the ones that are a little bit behind uh, times. Now, mitochondria um, is a name that we chose because we believe in biomimicry, uh, ask nature, we embrace this wisdom of nature, which nature has uh, endowed upon us. A few years ago, I looked at this question of hydrogen, and I wanted to locate mitochondria within a specific area of um, the hydrogen economy. And I found some research that was done by one of the consulting firms, estimating that by 2050, the hydrogen components market, components market will be $200 billion. And looking at the African history and the economy of Africa, I thought that should be the area where we should uh, focus. Um, and I set myself a target that I would like to participate in this $200 billion market. And the target we set ourselves is by 2050, we want to be a significant player, almost 20% of this um, um, hydrogen components um, market. Now, 20% of the hydrogen components market is 40 billion. And 40 billion is two and a half times the size of the current mining industry in South Africa. So we're not talking about an insignificant um, participation uh, in this uh, um, emerging old hydrogen story. We are talking about becoming serious uh, players. So what are we doing as mitochondria? Very briefly, there are three programs that I would like to explain. One is we are doing a Hydrogen Valley Innovation Hub in the Val region of Gauteng. And there we are going to be producing our own fuel cell technology. And the fuel cell technology is a technology that produces electricity without any moving parts. So you put in hydrogen and you get electricity, heat, and water. So there we are building that particular uh, sector with its value chain. And the value chain of hydrogen, I mean of fuel cells, is huge. If I had known that I would have had to deal with 150 different companies around the world to build that uh, uh, you know, a supply chain, I probably would not have gone into the industry. But it is an extensive uh, supply chain. We are building our own inverter um, in the Ferenagheng area. That work has started 
uh, for us. So the first one is the Hydrogen Valley. The second is what we developed when I was working in the Northwest province uh, some 20 years, uh, more than 20 years now, where we looked at the platinum group metals value chain. So we are developing what we call the platinum um, innovation hub, which will be based at the Madibang and more precisely in partnership with uh, Bosch, Robert Bosch, where ah, we will be so, developing. Yeah, so I think at that point, um, I want to I want to circle back to that point um, when we circle back to the second round. It's a very, very critical point you are segging into in terms of local capacity and capability to meaningfully contribute in this. Um, for now, uh, I'm, I'm glad you've given us an overview of uh, what mitochondria has been championing in the country. So park that one for now. And as you are you're already introducing Bosch, the company that you have a relationship with here. Uh, Velem, if I could quickly just get from you, um, um, you know, I know I don't want to get in yet into the specific technologies, but at a higher level, what is Bosch doing to drive this hydrogen economy um, forward in South Africa specifically? Yes, uh, I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes, okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Takane. For the question, um, thank you very much for, for having uh, us, Bosch, uh, on this platform. Uh, specifically, thank you to Mishur de Romano also for his uh, extending the invitation to us uh, to participate in this round. So, yeah, um, good question. Bosch has been around uh, for a very long time uh, in South Africa, nearly 70 years or so. Um, today, we play quite a significant role in, in advancing the hydrogen economy in South Africa with uh, various uh, stakeholder um, discussions, strategic partnerships, uh, focusing on really renewable energy to a large extent because this is uh, our goal to be uh, sustainable. What we've done is to then have a look at the entire value chain and, and hydrogen economy. We do this uh, globally, uh, specifically then in, in the Southern Africa region to see who are all the players, what are they doing, and uh, you know, this is then basically the starting points. Where do you connect with whom? Uh, and, you know, what uh, is the relationships like? How can you really have a win-win situation with, with many different uh, types of companies? Uh, Bosch is a long-standing um, business in um, the South African market. And, um, you know, more specifically to your point, uh, what is Bosch doing? We have today a factory in the Northwest province in Brits, uh, which is part of the automotive uh, hub sort of. Um, and yeah, we are producing some some components uh, for, for the local market and also for the export market. Um, we have a very strong drive to be sustainable with also our factories. We have something like, I think, 280 plus factories worldwide. Um, and, and we practice what we preach. And, and in this case, today we, really aim to decarbonize our factories um, as much as possible and, and uh, South Africa is no exception so for us today we see the, 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 the possibility to bring our hydrogen technologies and I, and I know you said we talk about the um, technologies a little bit later on and I'm happy to, obviously because that's a little bit of a different subject to, to go into the technologies um, but to employ basically the technologies into our uh, Brits plant um, to the extent of having the production of hydrogen on site, um, compressing that hydrogen, re-electrifying um, for our, let's say, our evening uh, cycles, and then further to that, uh, see what other opportunities would be available outside our own plant, inside um, okay. the economic zone to also help other industry players utilize hydrogen as a decarbonized fuel and, you know, using it also then to to uh, basically earn green certificates and be able to you know utilize that then to further be more competitive with exporting products um, 
reducing their own carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that would be in a nutshell without taking too much time because I know we have a lot to get through what, what we are doing right now. Great, thanks, Evelyn. I want to circle back to um, the country programs and policies. What we've seen with other technologies is that the very strong, consistent, and predictable policies have led to significant breakthroughs in markets that otherwise would have been slow. A case in point will be the public procurement rounds of renewable energy from IPPs that has been a has played a catalytic role in South Africa today, leveraging off uh, renewable energy technologies and markets and skills. So I'd like to cycle back to both uh, DSI, Dr. Chiteme, and ZEF uh, in terms of what we have seen globally and continue to see is countries understand their national strengths that they leverage on. Some leverage on their R&D capacity, some leverage on their manufacturing capacity, capabilities for the technology, whereas others leverage on the natural resources that they are endowed with. And uh, most markets, there were some markets focus on consumption side. So I'd like to circle back to policy South Africa level to say, what is it in this value chain that from a DBSA side, you are influencing policy to maximize and leverage into the hydrogen economy. And Dr. Chiteme, from the uh, DSI perspective, uh, so that we can get a feel for where policy is driving this conversation on both ends of commercialization and research. Uh, happy to start with DBSA to share some insights on this. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Takan. You know, McKinsey reported last year uh, that, uh, and uh, they, they did this after looking at some 1,000 uh, you know, large-scale hydrogen projects that they were investigating. And they reported that there is an, an infra a development, hydrogen development uh, financing gap of uh, $380 billion to 2030. And they said that 35, 36% of this is in the infrastructure space of, of, of this development. So that gap, uh, together with other development, uh, you know, uh, interests that we have, caused us to jump into action to set up a, a funding platform for South Africa, because we feel, uh, yes, there are uh, funds that could be allocated from the fiscars and probably from the DFIs that I mentioned earlier, but in our mind, that that won't be nearly enough. So we came together with uh, uh, Sunlam, uh, the Industrial uh, Development Corporation, and uh, two companies from the Netherlands to form what we call uh, the South African Hydrogen Fund. Um, this this is a platform that uh, we hope will do two things. Uh, it will it will catalyze uh, the attraction of uh, investment, but it will also deploy uh, funds into the development of uh, of the hydrogen economy. There are two uh, uh, tranches, if I can call them that. There is a development capital tranche that we hope it will help us during this early stage and, and, and support the development of project, uh, project preparation that I spoke about and so on. There is also the equity construction capital tranche, which then will be deployed into the actual construction of projects. The, the development capital tranche is about $100 uh, million. And the, the equity construction uh, tranche is, is, is a billion dollars. Now, to date, we have, uh, uh, we have raised the full uh, development capital tranche. And we are looking into closing that fund by this December. Uh, where we hope that all 
necessary documentation, you know, partnerships, subscriptions, facilities, agreement, and so on and so forth would have been signed. So that's 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 great because, as I said earlier, this is the part that we need uh, now as we start this uh, execution phase. The uh, equity construction capital uh, has got uh, three tiers, if you want to call them that. There is a junior tier for $200 million. There is uh, an ordinary equity tier for $400 million, and there's a senior uh, equity tier for $400 million. And we're looking at closing this particular tranche by April next year uh, to make sure that once the preparation of projects and the support at the early stages is done, uh, 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 interested parties can tap into the actual construction of projects. So this is, we think it's an important uh, augmentation of the government process uh, uh, f not only from a policy support, but from an actual deployment uh, of the of the process. Thanks very much um, for for that. I think it does show some commitment to move uh, the sector, the industry, along adopting faster green hydrogen technologies. From an R and D perspective, from DSI, uh, do we have anything unique to offer this uh, this um, this industry? I be catalytic or do we have uh, capabilities that we've invested in? Yeah, it, it, thanks a lot, um, um, Dr. Mtombeni. Um, I think um, you mentioned three very three, um, I mean, uh, three important uh, key aspects. The industrial and manufacturing capability, the R&D capability, as well as the natural resource endowment. And um, I think as a country, we are very much privileged that we can actually tick the, all the three boxes and say we have got capabilities in all those areas. Um, as far back uh, as uh, 2007, um, cabinet approved the uh, Hydrogen South Africa Research Development and Innovation uh, Strategy which has really been the key driver in actually setting the foundation uh, for the development of the local hydrogen economy. At the time, the focus was on actually, how can we um, promote local value addition um, and benefit our PGM uh, resource so that we actually um, create value-added goods locally rather than uh, continuing the, the status quo of um, sending the, uh, the PGMs elsewhere and then we, then we buy the value-added goods back. So um, on the basis of that program, and uh, I would like to really commend government for having made a very conscious decision to fund that program consistently from 2008 until now, uh, where again the project program has been extended by another 10 years. So um, through that research, development and innovation program, we have been able to create a very healthy portfolio of, of IP along the hydrogen and fuel cell value chain. And these stem from PGM-based catalysts uh, all the way up to value-added products such as membrane electrode assemblies, uh, catalyst coated membranes, as well as hydrogen storage uh, technologies based on metal hydrides. So we believe that uh, with all that um, capability, we have set ourselves um, up to be a very significant player within the global hydrogen economy value chain. Uh, and that is now being taken to, all those technologies are now being taken to market uh, through collaboration uh, between government and uh, the private sector. Uh, th thanks. Yeah, no, thanks very much. So what I would like to do is to, given what you say government has been doing and given what DBSA says government is making available as a support mechanism for the industry, can I circle back to mitochondria and sh can you share with us your experience in leveraging of these uh, two sides of, uh, of the spectrum in getting to where you are. For example, Pez, talk to us more about the Platinum Innovation Hub, which from your introduction sounds like it's linked very much to a 
local beneficiation of the, the PGMs. Could you take us through your experience in leveraging of what government says they are making available out there? So maybe I should start by painting why hydrogen and then I can respond to your question. If you look at the energy situation in the whole of the continent, Africa has more than 600 million people that have no access to modern energy services more than 600 million. And what we are saying is, and this is a fact, if you have no energy infrastructure and you have got poor energy systems, you have no economic development. And that's why most of our countries in the continent are poor. One study by Harvard, Ricardo Hausmann, says up to 30% of GDP in any economy is accounted for by energy infrastructure and energy provision. So this is very fundamental to changing the fortunes of the economy of our Region. So coming back to um, the, the, the how have we accessed uh, government um, inputs, I would like to single out the Department of Trade and Industry, the IDC, and the um, DBSA, they have been amazing partners of ours in the development of the uh, fuel cell project uh, that we are doing. We would not have been able to do that um, without their uh, input. So, so they have played um, an important role to where we are in this um, um, a development. What I think is necessary is um, um, a coordinated effort throughout the various government entities and departments to have a single sort of point of contact uh, coordinating these developments. What you currently have is DSI on one side, is the IDC on the other side, and is environmental affairs on another side, and maybe the presidency uh, also uh, doing certain things. But we need a much more coherent approach to the development of the hydrogen economy in our country. I think I want to say this very briefly, if you allow me. Uh, I believe very strongly that if we can develop the use of hydrogen in our economy and energy sector, we will create a much more dependable, secure energy uh, sector that is not dependent on um, fluctuations in the oil markets around the world. And if we can do that, South Africa will become a significant um, economy with stable energy um, provision. Thank you very much. Uh, it is um, good to hear that uh, it's not only government saying they have all these support mechanisms, but to hear of the beneficiaries speaking 
uh, of uh, having access them, uh, I think is very useful. Um, uh, my last round of questions to my panel here, I want to cycle back into the technology side in terms of unit costs and trends, particularly for green hydrogen. In Europe, it is said that they are currently sitting at about $5 or so per kilogram. Uh, they are hoping that a good indicator will be $2 per kilogram, but definitely wanting to drop below a uh, dollar per kilogram. Based on the research work on the go, based on the technology from Bosch that you see in globally, how far off are we in terms of uh, getting to that number, perhaps even $2 um, per, per kilogram of uh, hydrogen? Dr. Dr. Chiteme, what are we doing to reduce that, Bosch? What are you seeing as key levers to bring that down? Takani, is a question to me or to? It's to, <laughs> it's to both on the technology research. What are we doing to drive that down? Also on the active market front, what are you seeing uh, as innovation in the market that's uh, working to drive that down? I'm happy you start, Velen. Okay, perfect. 100%. Look, I'm, I'm, I must be honest, we are not uh, so much uh, focused on the cost of uh, the hydrogen at the pump because uh, at the end of the day, that's the market forces that determines uh, that number. So for, for Bosch, uh, that's that's not our focus. Our fo focus is, of course, to, to develop uh, uh, technologies um, and uh, industrialize it in large scale. And this is basically where, where I guess... Uh, I can answer your question to a very large extent and tell you a little bit about the technologies that's available from Bosch today. We have uh, really a huge portfolio of, of, of hydrogen technologies uh, on the market uh, in many different phases of the product life cycle from prototype to sample to um, B samples until um, series produced products, uh, just depending on, on, on of course, the, the, the type of technology that we are talking about. Um, we have actually a huge experience, um, you know, the company is 130 years old, as I said, with many factories. So we have huge experience with, with um, mass production and industrialization, setting up production lines that works uh, very efficiently. Um, with really, really deep, deep knowledge. And uh, and this is really helping uh, drive the, the, the cost down because, uh, you know, mass, uh, mass reduction means, means reduced cost. So, so in, in, a, in an overview, uh, what we are doing and, and why Bosch is uh, investing in all these technologies is because we uh, look at, at the market and we see there's, there's, a, there's a big demand. We have at the moment, uh, up until now, not at the moment, uh, contributed already or invested already two and a half billion euros um, into technologies over many decades, um, starting already from uh, water purification that is needed for, for the electrolysis. We have developed a um, electrolyzer stack, a standard 1.25 megawatt um, product uh, that is fitting uh, very well in, in, a, in, a, in a robotic industrial line. Excuse me. Um, we are also investing heavily into the production of uh, the solid oxide fuel cell, mostly for the baseload power generation. Uh, for the PEM electro, uh, for the PEM fuel cells, we are already into mass production, um, producing three to four different uh, types of, of, of fuel cells. With with many customers uh, globally, mostly I guess in in, in, the, in, the, in the Europe and. and the um, eastern eastern region. Uh, then you know, since uh, there is still the, I guess the the push pull uh, between um, fuel cell electric vehicles and uh, renewable fuels, we also invest into the technologies of combustion. So we have today also a portfolio of products available for combustion into the engine. You see already many companies launching. Industri uh, internal combustion engines with pure hydrogen fuel injection in Europe. There's already been three or four just recently at the IIA show in, in Germany. There's a room for um, dual fuel injections as a, as a transition technology today for heavy commercial off-highway type vehicles. It depends, you know, what, what is the best fit, what drivetrain is the best fit for, for those uh, specific applications. We do also... Um, a lot of work together with our sister company, Bosch Rexroth, uh, fully owned by Bosch, uh, doing uh, a lot of compression um, 
on either liquid or, or, or gas um, um, hydrogen. Then we extend even into boilers, gas boilers, um, some gas boilers, steam boilers, or industrial um, uh, water boilers. Um, and we go up to 55,000 kilograms an hour or even 38,000 kilowatts. Uh, we have these boilers that, that's ready to, to burn hydrogen as well. So we create a lot of uh, offtake also um, for, for, for this um, economy. And, and maybe to finish off on that, you know, how to, how to scale, how to learn, um, how to make sure the product uh, life is coming, that the product is coming down in price as, as time goes by. Yeah, you have to learn. And, and in this case, we have already a digital twin um, in many different formats that we could uh, use as a software program and install it on different machines to learn and, and therefore, you know, drive down the costs. No, thanks uh, for that, Willem. There's um, uh, one connected question here that goes back to Dr. Chitem and Zev. One, this is to do with uh, the demand for this green hydrogen not being visible and the projects that are being announced um, even I think last week, uh, there's reports that the, the much spoken about project in Namibia is also hitting some, some developmental snags. So are you able to position the South Africa roadmap as far as uh, what it is that we're learning from there to proactively de-risk our roadmap, uh, Zef, as well as um, uh, the demand? Where is the demand? Where are people signing so projects can get going? What are we seeing on that front, Zef? Yeah, <clears throat> I think it becomes very important to ensure that the early stage <clears throat> preparation of projects and support for project is in place. And it's precisely for that reason uh, that projects should be bankable. There's about uh, nine projects that are, are in action at the moment. Uh, uh, most of them are in the Northern Cape, including the Bokubai. Uh, and, and the DBSA is actively involved in, in uh, a whole range, a number of them. And uh, the, the approach that we are emphasizing is to make sure that these projects are bankable, because otherwise uh, you will not find the uh, investors. So I'm, I'm just emphasizing the early stage support uh, for these kinds of projects to make sure that uh, they, they continue. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a simple, straightforward uh, you know, sector. So we understand that there'll be, there'll be those challenges early on. Great, I think that uh, does give a view of some of the challenges in promoting these uh, technologies uh, at this stage of for where we are. Uh, perhaps uh, we are expecting way too much too soon from this sector, we, we, we're not sure, uh, but uh, it's encouraging that we are, I think, moving in, in the right direction. Um, and uh, from um, what I can hear here, there seems to be one, a need for policy alignment. Um, and, uh, and this is a question that's also now has come up in the Q&A where people are saying, can we get uh, a single di country direction? Because we seem to be having government departments speaking in different um, uh, directions. Maybe it's confusing to the market. So that goes back to the need for shaping the policy discussions there. And also from what I'm hearing, there seems to be this burning need to get the Buche buys and these other projects that we have to get to production so that uh, we can uh, ultimately get to see the value proposition uh, manifest. Uh, and uh, at this stage, it does look like uh, the actual demand is uh, it's, it's kind of weak. Yes, we're leaving it to the market, but the market is, is hesitant um, without these big um, uh, well-priced or well-costed projects to deliver on the green hydrogen. Uh, and it, it, it seems like there's a lot more work still that we need to do to create uh, an enabling platform where we can also have a, a, a budding SMME sector supporting it. Um, we've heard from uh, mitochondria talking to some hundred and more than hundred of uh, 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 suppliers and contractors involved in the sector. 
So there is definitely something for the country, but it does seem like uh, we need some catalytic lighthouse project to get us there and demonstrate all of these. Um, and, and Shannon, I'd like to um, uh, dip into some of the questions that have been posted here for our panel uh, to make sure that uh, we, we maximize um, and tap into their knowledge uh, fully here. Uh, we've dealt with a question of uh, policy alignment. We've dealt with uh, and, and, the, and the request there for um, policy alignment. Uh, we've also um, reflected on the, uh, the Namibia's Green Project. Uh, there's a question here where we are told that the, it's moving faster than the South Africa's projects. Um, and we're not quite sure uh, why that might be the case and what can be done to catch up. And uh, Zef, I think you are probably closer to giving some uh, uh, some explanations from what you can see over there. Yeah, no, thanks, Takan. I, I wouldn't want to go into specific projects yeah. uh, or details of, of uh, projects, but I think there are very clear uh, opportunities that we should, uh, you know, uh, tap into. Uh, one of them is uh, the fact that uh, industrialization is back and this time around it is green uh, so uh, we need to make sure that we we tap into our into our critical minerals uh, that we have in this country to push this green uh, industrialization and make sure that uh, mining, construction, engineering, manufacturing, across the value chain, they all benefit you know, to this process. So I think we, we need to focus on that and, and not be bogged down uh, by these individual uh, projects. I know these projects are continuing and, and they have you know, support, but as I said, I think they, it's, it's early on, it's early days, so you need, we need to be, to be patient uh, about that. There's a whole uh, new opportunity opening for local communities uh, from, from this process. And uh, I think this will help us to, to actually capitalize and focus on the just element of our transition to push you know, local uh, jobs, local training, uh, local employment, and so on. So I'm, I'm suggesting that there is a whole range in, much more opportunities that are going to open up as we move in. But let's understand it's it's, it's early on in the execution. Yeah, I think I no, should. Um, sorry, I think let me uh, come in here. Uh, we have analyzed the hydrogen projects in Africa. There is about ninety over ninety uh, projects. Many of those projects are designed to supply hydrogen to markets uh, elsewhere. And I think um, they have had a challenge because to be able to supply to Europe or Japan or some other markets, you need um, some agreements uh, that uh, your product is going to be um, um, you know, bought. What we have focused on is how do we use the hydrogen economy to deal with the challenges that Africa is facing. For instance, um, Dr. Kleko has just uh, mentioned the issue of leave no one behind. You know, uh, when we were developing our project, we went to the Val area and we said, we are coming to build a factory here. Um, what are you going to supply? So we begin to conscientize our people about the need for them to see these opportunities as business opportunities for them, rather than coming up later and saying, well, I want to be a BE partner. We want them to start thinking now that they can be active participants in this emerging huge economy. So the issue of skills, we are working with a VAL 
um, um, University of Technology, where we are saying, we're going to be employing people in this area. Can you start now training um, people that are going to be employed? So this thing doesn't become something that people just see out there. They see it as something that will be of benefit for them. We're looking at employing in that area of the Val 400 people in our facility. And we are developing a similar project with in the Northwest, uh, where we will also be um, manufacturing platinum-based related uh, products, but for local economic development. No, thank you very much. It, it does seem very clear, and, um, and also questions coming through, that uh, whatever the country does in this direction, we will have to define and, and fully maximize the social value proposition and make sure we reach as many local suppliers, develop as many for the longevity of, uh, of the sector. There is a question here with regards to the role, I believe, of PGMs in the space. Um, it's, uh, so when you look at fuel cells and you look at um, the electrolyzers that are used to produce the hydrogen, you look at the fuel cells that are used to convert that into other forms of energy, there is a concentration of, uh, of uh, PGMs that go into those technology packages. So there is definitely a role, a significant role that PGMs play in that space. So the overall conversation uh, will have to include that as part of the local beneficiation conversation, which I'm sure Dr. Chiteme was one of, that was one of the discussions in, at the early stage when um, cabinet approved a lot of this work. Any comment on that? Yeah, indeed. Um, that's why I think as a country, we have focused on um, proton exchange membrane technology, uh, both for hydrogen production, uh, as well as um, fewer cells because of the amount of PGMs that go into that uh, particular technology. Uh, so there are indeed uh, still um, areas uh, of uh, research where we need to uh, reduce the, the loading of the PGMs, but at the same time uh, maintain the performance. So that, um, as much as it might sound counterintuitive, it's about actually not compromising the performance, but uh, reducing the cost in order to increase the uptake of the technology. So that's some of the technology areas that we, we are looking at. But also to just build on um, what um, Mashutu said earlier about really stimulating the domestic uh, consumption of hydrogen. We believe that uh, there is ample opportunities to decarbonize various sectors of our economy, whether it's cement production, um, uh, steel production, or even the power generation sector. And we believe that uh, some of the projects that we have done around carbon capture and use, where you then capture and convert the flue gas um, into value-added products, those are some of the uh, technologies that are not only going to stimulate the domestic demand for hydrogen, but also maintain our market share, even uh, at the export level, while addressing issues of the just energy transition. Great, thank you very much uh, to the panel. And uh, there's lots of questions here that uh, we may not be able to get through to all of them, looking at the clocks. So I'd like to, perhaps 30 seconds, each one of the panelists, uh, what you see coming up ahead, uh, what should excite uh, the audience. Uh, strictly 30 seconds so that we can uh, make sure that uh, we, we get there on time. I'll start from DBSA and then I'll move to Maito and then I'll talk to Bosch and then uh, talk to Chitan. No, thank you, Takan. I think the point I want to conclude on is the at this early stage of execution, the challenges are much more than financing. There's a, there's a whole range of things that we must work on from policy to preparing projects to supporting, you know, sponsors and so on. 
So that becomes uh, very important for us to take into account. And uh, the, the call to, to all uh, investors to, to participate in the South African Hydrogen Fund is still out. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Maito, 30 seconds, what do we see ahead? Well, for me, we need to eliminate energy poverty in Africa and hydrogen gives us that uh, uh, possibility. We need to address Africa's need to industrialize. We should no longer just be consumers of other people's uh, productive capability, but hydrogen gives us the opportunity to industrialize. I think the biggest thing for me is how do we promote a culture or, and a mindset and a spirit of making things using the hydrogen economy? Thank you. That's a very uh, apt. Uh, Dr. Chiteme? Yeah, um, just to highlight that um, I think we as a country uh, and uh, in fact as a SADAC region, we are very blessed with the um, critical minerals that are required in the energy transition, whether it's the hydrogen economy or the um, mobility in terms of battery electric vehicles. Um, we just need to get uh, on with it and make sure that uh, we really leverage those that resource endowment to promote industrialization uh, in the region through these new energy initiatives. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's very much exciting. And Bosch, I'm sure you'll tell us that the, the factory is ready to produce and to support local <laughs> development and SMEs. Did I close it correctly for you? Yes, and we have a job even there for you if you want to, Connie. So, you know, everybody can be happy. Now we are here to stay. We have been here for a long time and we are here to, to, to drive the economy together as, as a private sector uh, with the government. Uh, we want to uh, create jobs, stimulate the economy, make, uh, bring skills and resources. You know, the, the Germans are very strong in this case. So we're open for business and thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panelists and the audience for staying with us as well as Shannon and the team. May I uh, hand over the microphone to yourself, Shannon? Thanks so much, Takani. That does bring us to the end of our webinar. Thank you to everyone who participated in the Q&A. We'll go through everything and where possible, we'll try and respond to you. But I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our facilitator, Dr. Takani Mtombeni, for an able, enabling and engaging discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Dr. Cosmos Chiteme from the Department of Science and Innovation, Mashudu Ramano from Mitochondria Energy Systems, Zef Nschleko from Development Bank of Southern Africa, and Willem Furt from Robert Bosch South Africa for their insight. Thank you to our sponsors, Parker Hannafin and Mitochondria Energy Systems for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on South Africa's hydrogen economy. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We really appreciate your participation. Our next webinar takes place on 23 October at 2 p.m. and will focus on transport infrastructure. Um, the link to register for that will be shared with you soon. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so much for your time and goodbye.